Hello, Mary Kate. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. How are you, Martina? Very good. I'm so looking forward to have this conversation with you. Um, for those that are listening right now, tell us briefly who you are and what you do. I'm Mary Kate McDevitt, and I'm a lettering artist and illustrator, and I'm living here in Vermont. Amazing. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> you were you were telling me a little bit about the the moving. Uh, so you moved to Vermont. Uh, yeah. A year ago or a couple of years two ago? Year, uh, almost two years ago. It'll be two years yeah. in like one month, which is pretty wild. Uh, yeah. So I moved here from Philly um, and it's pretty wild moving from a huge city like Philly to literally a town of 600 people. <laughs> I mean, I'm not in the mm -hmm. middle of nowhere in a way. I mean, I kind of am, but uh, there's little towns near me. <laughs> And and how how moving city is because um, I believe that, like now you live in a very small city. So how was that change for you, and how that impacted your life? In which ways it did, or if it did, in any way? I mean, it definitely did. Uh, it, I mean, it it was it was a pandemic move. Mm -hmm. um, I always said that if I were to live anywhere outside of a city, I would live in Vermont. And oh, yeah. Uh, I think because I don't know why. I mean, it's funny. I've always had Vermont kind of in the back of my head for a long time. Mm. My my first my I had a fake ID, <laughs> and when I got it, you get to like choose wherever you're from, and I chose Burlington, Vermont. <laughs> so <laughs> it's full circle. Uh, uh, but yeah, like I I've had I've have friends here, so it was easy to make a friend group, and then so many little things started lining up here, mm. like across the street with there's people our age, which is pretty wild. Most of the people on my street are like over 60 years old. So we're <laughs> definitely like the youngsters. And there's people our age who's like a podcast producer and musician. And my husband is a podcast producer and musician. So it was like crazy. Um, some friends from who I knew when I lived in Portland, moved here in the same town. Um, Tyler and Elsa have always with honor. So we hang out with them. And uh, yeah, my best friend from college, she lives in the very next town over. So it's been great to have a friend group. And uh, I really love like outdoor stuff and hiking and skiing. Mm. And so that definitely made a lot of sense to do that. And uh, we're only two hours from Montreal, which is a beautiful city. And mm. so it's nice kind of having that just nearby. So it makes it not feel so secluded. And in terms of your business or your career as a lettering artist, do you feel that it had any impact on the amount of work that you get or how many, you know, the people you connect with or? You know, um, I still, I feel like conferences are kind of just starting up again. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, it was pretty easy to just not really feel like the need for so much uh, like design stuff going on. Yeah, I mean, stuff had opened up and everything by then. But in terms of getting clients, I mean, I've moved around a lot in my career, and it never really mattered um, where I lived. I never even really got that many local clients mm. when I lived in Philly. So interesting. Uh, I, in a way, I, I think when I first moved here, I think, um, maybe it slowed down a little bit and I don't know if it was just cause you know, who knows still like pandemic style s slowing down of work. Um, which I know I, it happened to me. I, I think it happened to a few other people I know. I, I want to go deeper into those stories and the things that you experienced throughout your career, including like moving cities and working with other people and stuff. But, you know, to get started with this, with this episode, I, I have to say that before, you know, preparing for, for this show and like kind of preparing the questions and the things I wanted to talk to you about, because Mary, you have been in the podcast already and I wanted to have you for a second round because the format of the podcast has changed over the seasons and and I wanted to dive deeper into your personal story and how you build your your career as a lettering artist and stuff. And I have to say that while preparing for the episode, 
it turns out that I didn't find much about you online. Oh. You know, I wanted to find these little stories and like the interviews and like the, you know, like the posts on social and stuff. Of, of course, you have a presence on, on social media, um, but it was hard for me to find um, like interesting details about you and your career and stuff. And it makes me feel like, you know, the time, the time, the one time we met uh, in person, mm -hmm. Um, which was in a conference in Salt Lake City, remember? Yeah, yeah I remember. And, and I remember that you came across as a very humble, private person. Still, you you were really approachable and really open to connect. And you were just speaking about this, like how you are missing that kind of connection and hanging out with people and stuff. So I really wonder if 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 this is on purpose, if, you, if this has to do with your personality, the fact that there's not so much out there about you uh, because being an accomplished lettering artist and illustrator uh, that you are um, I wonder how how did you manage to to stay so private uh, nevertheless I don't know I guess I didn't really think of myself so much as like private um, mm. uh, yeah I guess it's like it's been a while since I've done like interviews like for blogs or websites or something mm. um, and I think maybe more of it's just people don't ask me to, uh, to do interviews maybe <laughs> maybe that's it uh and um yeah I guess uh I don't know I like for instance the way Instagram is changing mm. and um like if I come across as being private uh then maybe it's like I'm not doing the like long real videos with my face mm. out there. Um, yeah. Sometimes I think uh, it's something I'm kind of uncomfortable with, but I really do like enjoy being uh, having conversations, doing talks and podcasts yeah. and stuff. But uh, it is hard to keep up. I mean, there's so much to keep up with just having, you know, just with client work and your personal work. And then I need to also be, my face on screen all the time. It's like, yeah, very, very few days I feel camera ready, let's say. <laughs> yeah. So maybe that's uh, kind of also it. I just, I, I think I probably, yeah, I guess I come across maybe as someone who keeps things close to the chest. I, but it's, I certainly don't mean, it's not on purpose, I guess. Hmm. Um, Yeah, I, I I don't mean it in a negative way at all. Um, sure. I would say it rather 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 at the opposite. You know, I wonder. You know, I I feel that oftentimes um, new artists or lettering artists or illustrators or artists in general, we feel that we need to be everywhere and we need to be on social. We need to, um, you know, you, we need to be present and exposed. And I I think it's a great it's great to look at you and see how you go about social media and, and all the different platforms. And nevertheless, you have, you know, you, you have a successful career as a lettering artist and you make a living with your work, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a must to do that. And that's why I wanted to ask you, how do you go about it? And, and if this is an, like a really conscious decision or is more like well this is the way I am and or the way I react to to how the things are changing with social media and stuff yeah you know what um I think because I'm kind of thinking about any of the last time I I was more public uh mm. like And it was earlier on in my career. Like I was just thinking, I used to do, I have six Skillshare classes, and yeah. I haven't done a new one in almost seven years. Yeah. If not, yeah, probably seven years, which is wild. Oh my god. Yeah. Because I just I did so many, and then, so I think maybe. Um, And it's also like early on in your career, like you really do need to make a splash if mm. you're going to want. So I was really seeking out um, more publicity, let's say. Mm. And I, I think maybe now it, it just became less of a necessity and mm. just kind of speaking to my comfort levels, just like, yeah, not wanting to constantly do a reel or Um, it's really hard doing a Skillshare class all the time. I think, you know, um, 
the time it you put into it and the time after engaging with the yeah. students, it's a big time commitment. Um, but I've also have had Skillshare list on my to-do list maybe every single day for the past seven years. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's just kind of something that I want to do, but just maybe I haven't found the time or made the time also yeah. is a really big thing, which is something that, yeah, I haven't really, uh, I mean, I have thought about it, but it's like, yeah, I'm not making the time because I, I do really enjoy doing other things outside of work. And, yeah. um, you know, I think about it's it's no coinky dink that my like big kind of block of creative block in my career mm. kind of lined up with right after up into doing, you know, like I did an interview with The Great Discontent and mm. I did, I was doing more podcasts back then and the Skillshare mm. classes. And I think I was kind of gaining this momentum. And I mean, yeah, it's like something I uh, I talk about. I, my, the last talk I did um, in Memphis mm. at... Um, Oh my God, what was the, what was the conference called? Oh my God, it was so fun. Anyway, it was about, I was doing a talk on creative block and mm -hmm. I think it just, it's, yeah, it all lined up after the big push of just mm -hmm. putting yourself out there constantly from like all different angles, blogs, podcasts, books, Skillshare classes, Instagram, Twitter, Etsy shop. And I've, I, a yeah. lot of those slowed down. And I think it was a fact that I had to really listen to myself and what um what i was comfortable with putting out there at the time and i think right now i'm i'm really i, f I feel like i'm gearing up to maybe do another splash so watch out world <laughs> <laughs> so I, I i want to unpack this a little bit before we get into talking about creating a creative block i want to go back to what you mentioned before, which has to do with making that big splash early in your career, what, how did that look like for you? Uh, I'm thinking of those listening who may be thinking like, okay, what, what should that big splash mean for me, right? And mm -hmm. I, I wonder how, how, how was that for you? Well, so, I mean, this, I feel like we're going back some years. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it was 2000. Eight, uh, mm. I was working at a design studio kind of um, after college, like 2007, 2008. And um, I had uh, been, you know, this, I wasn't really like excited about the work I was doing at this studio. It was like, you know, first out of like first job out of college type work production. Yeah some fun exciting projects but far and few in between so i was um making posters with my like motivational phrases and uh lettering them and uh selling them on etsy and i was making these chalkboards all like kind of around motivation and i was doing lettering and uh i was putting them out there and i wanted to so have like some supplemental income because I knew I wasn't going to be at this job for much longer. And I think I was really, uh, freelance was calling to me. I was really drawn to it. So, um, hmm. why, 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 why do you feel that freelance was calling you? You know, it's, um, I, I, uh, I love working with clients and I had done some small kind of illustration projects like right after I finished college mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I, I think we were told like you can, the only way you can make a career doing illustration is freelancing. So mm. like we were, to we talked about, um, you know, making postcards, sending them out to art directors. So I was already made aware of it and it was, a, so it was appealing because I can just like, sit at my house and draw and paint all day and make a living doing that and I'm my own boss that that was count, really appealing. count me in yes count me in I mean that's 
it just it seemed to suit my schedule it's uh, <laughs> as someone who was not an early person certainly not then and uh yeah it there was a lot of things that were just like like I could live anywhere or it the freedom of it hmm. and also a lot of not freedom which you know maybe we'll talk to laughter but so uh so I was emailing blogs to feature my Etsy shop and so I really got used to talking about myself, talking about my work and putting myself out there. And I mean, at the time, I mean, this was like right when the blog boom happened. So mm. I was I mean, I was reaching out to like home decor blogs, even mm. not only like design and illustration ones. So it was like I'm like posters and art where do people look for posters and art outside of like making design stuff for designy people or illustration stuff for illustration -y people? Uh, I'd be like, oh, people like hanging art in their homes. And there were just, I mean, I love interior design. So I follow a lot of those blogs anyway. And like lifestyle blogs, all those. I mean, there were so many. So uh, it made it easy to find who to reach out to from my little Etsy shop. And I was selling a lot of work, and in between that time, I um, could actually make the switch to freelance, mm -hmm. you know, with mm -hmm. a very, my my little salary, what I was making for myself, which I can't even imagine what it was, probably not much, and I moved to Portland, mm -hmm. and around then, I, it's like, then I started reaching out to galleries, seeing, like, if you want to have, if, if I can have a show there, or, um, meeting artists there and that there a huge freelance community was in Portland mm. so it made it easy to kind of learn from other people and collaborate and um and so yeah like making connections in this community and then um you know ultimately working with a bunch of big clients and just making an actual go out of it and working a lot <laughs> to make it happen yeah and and like because you mentioned before that you had you know you started with this splash of like okay train train out a lot of different strategies to get your work out there and and gain some momentum and stuff and you mentioned that you got this creative block or you experienced this creative block which made you make as I as I hear it, made you feel okay, or made you think about okay, what what are of all the things I want to continue doing, or do I want to continue down this road? Um, so how did it look like for you this creative block, and what when did that happen? Like when when did this creative block um, showed up or happen for you? I feel like it's hard to pinpoint exactly when, mm. um, and it was a confluence of a bunch of different reasons you know, personal and work related and all these different things. I would say in the 2018 hmm. year. Um, so, so eight, 10 years into your freelance. Yeah. Yeah. Practice. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, and I think maybe even before that, I was sort of figuring some things out that I had to, you know, say no to. Um, mm. And look out for look out for me this time <laughs> like like what like like you know not constantly making time for creating personal work on top of client works uh going mm. to bed at reasonable hours and mm. um not working weekends even and i mean there was just a lot of a lot of things i just got so into just saying yes to everything mm. um that it just it wore me out and mm. I think that's that is kind of when you know there's um more gaps in my Instagram posts or like not on Twitter at all or mm. uh like maybe not even going to design events mm. even I don't know like just not um yeah not making the time because I I wasn't up for it. And it was yeah. even before I even really considered that it was creative block. I just thought, 
I mean, the what your stupid brain tells you is just like, oh, well, mm. it's probably because you suck. That's mm. like, and not actually putting the word creative block on it. Yeah. Um, you know, and like, you know, a hint of depression and everything. Um, and yeah. it was, uh, yeah, early or l- around 2018, I started going to therapy and started figuring out these things and being a little easier on myself and being that, cause it's like, it's, it's a thing that happens and so many people yeah. go through it and, uh, it does feel, it feels debilitating and yeah. you're questioning like, you know, even if I'm not c- conscious or unconsciously saying no to things, hmm. um, it just means like, oh God, I can't even do that either. Or like, oh, no hmm. one even asked me to do this anymore. Um, and I think I had just not given myself the space to uh, think about these things from that angle, from this angle that it's like outside of your control. And yeah. it just really just suddenly happened. And now uh, having a healthier outlook on it. Um, yeah. How, how did you go about getting out of it? Because I mean, all the things that you are saying, I can relate to it. And, and, and I mean, we, I think we belong more or less to the same generation. And I think we, we pretty much grew up in like a hostile culture where, you know, you, you need to work and you need, you know, this culture of like the hard work and putting in the hours and yeah, totally. And, and, um, and that, uh, definitely took a toll on many of us. I, I can totally uh, resonate with that. And uh, all the things that you're saying is things that I have experienced myself. Mm-hmm. And and that can be, you know, to the outside world could be something that not everyone gets to see. And, and you know, it's from 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 other people, people's per- perspective that mm-hmm. might seem like, okay, she's having it totally a successful career and she's traveling here and there but then at the same time you are miserable and worn out right yeah, because you yeah, are yeah. trying to please everybody clients speaking engagements social media um and suddenly you you miss taking care of yourself right and i yeah. i know this is also something that happens to many artists out there and many of the people who are listening right now i bet that they can also relate to this um, that you know, I I often feel that one of the the great things about our work is that we turn we we do work that we love, and we also turn something that used to be our hobby into our work, and then we miss like putting the boundaries yes. to this, right? Like yeah. so, suddenly work starts flooding all of your life and you work on Sundays um, you work on weekends you work until midnight and yes and then and then it's uh, you notice how that takes a toll on you right <laughs> yes so I, I I I wanted to go back to the question of like how do you get out of it w- were there specific things that you put in place mm-hmm. to actually get back on track into a healthier lifestyle yeah um well, it's, it is something that I kind of reflected on because it was sort of something like I would like kind of just have to listen to it. And yeah, it's like you said, I mean, it's so personal. So of course, like your work is so personal. It is this mm. thing that like you've always been doing and it was your hobby. And like now, so it's like if something's going wrong, you take it personally. Mm. Um, and if something's going wrong, it's it kind of starts to and by going wrong it's just like having this you know creative block you know uh, sneak up on you so um it makes it really like when it so when it feels like that it makes it really hard to work i mean that's Mm, part of it and um you know i i still had uh, client work throughout it and you Mm. know a lot of them were repeat clients like um like where there's sort of like an established, uh, you know, it feels familiar. So it Mm. like, it was really lucky that I did have that because, um, because, you know, help pay the bills, kept kept the lights on and everything and help me stay a little bit afloat. Uh, I mean, because if client work completely dried up, 
that would be really hard. And I'm not saying just like that's impossible either if it does happen. So what I noticed myself doing was because I did have to kind of be at my office in some capacity. Uh, yeah. One, I I was at a I had a separate studio space at the time, but um, I it was hard for me to go to the studio because mm. it I was like oh I'm not even going to clock in a full day here anyway why bother. So I was just like, okay, that's fine. It's like I had this little MK being like fairly gentle with myself and kind of allowing myself to have these feelings. So I'm like, I set up my studio at home. I literally brought my Cintiq and my computer home, which really, it felt like a defeat, you know, mm. like cleaning out your studio space, really. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, you're not, that's jumping the gun. But I was just like, what am I going to do? I, I, I can't leave it there and just ignore it and just have this like I can't go to it so anyway so I brought it to my house and uh, started working from home hmm. and working on the client work when I could and in between that so when I did I sat at my desk um, I would just write something hmm. I noticed just either it was writing a to-do list and um, I would try and talk about the to-do list a little bit like hmm be a little bit more detailed. It just kind of gave me something to uh, not like have something to focus on, but not think about it too much. Yeah. And then along with that, I mean, if you put a, a notebook and a pen in front of me and some free time, <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to doodle. So I did a lot of just like mindless doodling and mm. it, got to a point where I was not caring about what I was drawing, which really helped because mm. before it was like, um, you know, I've never had a pristine sketchbook ever. So it wasn't necessarily like I had that pressure of like all the sketches in here need to be perfect, perfect. But it's still hard to, I mean, anytime there's a sketchbook, like this is the, this is my the journal this is everything that goes into my creative so if something's not right how embarrassing if it's gonna you know look <laughs> look crappy so totally. there is still that there's always that little bit of pressure that uh you put on yourself when you're going into your sketchbook so i decided to let it go and like man those sketchbooks are um not anything super inspiring uh, and they're just they, they literally look like I'm like half asleep or something too. Um, but it kept me busy and it really allowed myself to slowly re-enter into it. So I would maybe start doodling and like, like something I just did mm. and mm. noticing things. And then I was a little bit more deliberate and I would maybe, I'm like, oh, you know, it would be cool if there was some color. And I, yeah. I just, I didn't even realize I was making progress. I just thought I was still doing this mindless doodling because I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm failing and no one cares and blah, blah, blah. Still being mean <laughs> to myself the entire time. Still being like, well, it's all over. Just call it quits and just... <laughs> doodle that's all you're good for but wow that's tough it's so yeah it was and you know it wasn't every day but it was a lot mm. and so I yeah I just basically I kind of uh, was telling people like it's like I ugly drew my way out and yeah. um because I think and maybe this is the way my brain works like um when I start to find patterns or start mm. to find something that I want to improve I get like fixated on it and then so that's when my doodles became more of these like fun patterns and pieces of art that I look at now and I'm proud of but it, you know at the time I, so I was just like and it just kind of got me in that direction of um then I started doing some lettering and like whenever I uh there's a few little uh, numbers that would pop up. Like I love drawing numbers when I'm like stuck. Like yeah. I love drawing the number two. Uh, so that would that would just so my twos I notice kind of looking back 
uh, the twos got more illustrative as I went on. I, I love the idea of like ugly drawing your way out of a creative block. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I want to like, I'm just, uh, I just, uh, I'm just hanging on that. But um, I want to ask you if there's any other things that you put in place that had to do with pursuing a more healthy way of living, not only things that had to do with the way you go about your, you know, finding your style or creating new work, but also if you put other things in place, like, I don't know, limiting your working hours or doing more sports or eating better or all that stuff, like, were there any other things that influenced your your way out of the creative blog? Yeah, absolutely. So like, that was like, when I was at my desk, which was already mm. cut down by hours by a lot. And I think, you know, um, there was a decent amount of work to kind of keep me busy throughout the week. So, but not enough where it wasn't my like typical full schedule. And so I was saying no to projects um, a little bit more than I definitely would ever. And mm. it was, I just wasn't comfortable with what I was making and I didn't want to mm. make myself. Yeah. So because I did have more of this free time, I actually, so I was living in Philly and it was really great because I just started going on these really long walks mm. and, uh, like there were a few times that I walked to, the art museum, which mm. if you look at the Philly map, like where Fishtown, where I was living all the way up to the art museum, I actually think it's like four miles. So it's not mm. that much, <laughs> but it looks like a lot. Cause it's like, it looks like I'm walking across town. <clears throat> um, but yeah, like four, maybe even less mm. than that. And I would walk to the art museum, mm. go through the art museum and I would get lunch by myself and, it was also, yeah, it was, uh, I did, <laughs> I, I did spend a lot more time by myself, which mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, for me, it worked for me, but I wonder if I reached out. I mean, support was also, yeah. I mean, moving on to the next thing, support was a huge thing that ended up helping. So maybe secluding myself for as long as I kind of did. Uh, but that, that is definitely what, that's like my, uh, I'm an introvert, extrovert. I'm like, I can be when I'm, when I'm in the, you know, um, when I'm ready. I mean, if you see me on the dance floor, you'd be like, she, oh, wild child. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also an introvert. So it's just like, when I'm like, uh, wounded, I'm just like, I'm like a cat. I'm just like crawl into a corner and just like, leave me alone <laughs> until I'm better. So so I, yeah, I did a lot of that and just kind of was doing those things that I always told myself mm. <laughs> I would do when I lived in a city, like when I was a kid. So I, yeah, like I would buy flowers or maybe it's just like anything I saw like uh, on Sex the City or something. <laughs> it's just like retreating back to some um, city fantasy life that I had that I never really did a lot of like the chic um things like getting lunch by myself and having a you know a, a glass of wine mm. uh for happy hour um and going to the museums so after so then after that it was when i was just like i guess it's it's like you just kind of have to listen to yourself so i mm. i think i was craving connection again um so i was telling people about what I was going through and talking about it more and talking to my studio mate more about it, who, mm. you know, at the time I've just like abandoned in a way because yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm out of here and, um, and starting therapy, which was huge. Yeah. I had never mm. gone to therapy ever before in my life. And, um, and I've been seeing her now for five years or amazing. Yeah. So since, I can't do math, but yeah, almost five years and it's been great. I mean, yeah, she's still based in Philly. So we've been doing with pandemic. Well, well since yeah, 2020, since to now we've been doing it online, which um, 
I miss in-person therapy. Mm. Anyway, so yeah, so reaching out, it's like, it, it's just, it's your comfort level. And it is a lot yeah. of like, with dealing with creative block, a lot of it is, like I keep saying, like listening to yourself and just your comfort levels. Mm -hmm. And when you're ready to get back into a routine and it's a slow process. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's probably ways you can speed it up, uh, but it, it does, it def which definitely includes challenges and challenging mm -hmm. yourself, um, which is hard, but that can also be really fulfilling. And I yeah. definitely did a few, uh, there were a few times where I felt challenged, um, particularly in like the kind of project I took on that would be like, okay, this is a, like a quick deadline and a bigger kind of client and, um, and feeling ready and like excited yeah. and to get excited. And it is just like, kind of, it is <laughs> really, and maybe this is dealing with any kind of rut in your life is mm. just tricking yourself into getting excited about things. Um, yeah. Because you can't just keep wallowing. Certainly not. And your mind's not going to want to do that anyway at some point. Um, so it's just like whatever you're kind of feeling like, like with me doodling, just being like, oh, oh, I kind of like what I did just then. <laughs> and just one for one split second, forgetting that you're in that place and just like, oh, well, that was kind of fun and keep chasing that. I love that. I think this is so useful. And I thank you so much for sharing that because I think we don't speak enough about this. And I think yeah. it, by you by you sharing all of this story and how you went through it and the things that you experienced, I think those listening can really relate and, and feel less alone because yeah. this happens to many of us. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes I think it's really interesting what you pointed out, which is like, oftentimes we don't, sp we don't, we don't speak about it. Um, you know, I also went through the process of like going through, um, yeah, going through a creative block or going through a big challenge in my life, in my career. And I also went and I also used the, the walks around the city. I, I used to in 2020 or 2019, I started walking in the, in the nights. Yeah. And and I think that's the first step when you can take some time to, you know, to spend on your own, to just relax and not do any work re related thing and then is the this the the next step which is like opening up and allowing other people to help you right and i think it was so important that you started talking about it with with your colleagues and the people around you and that you also reach out for help because what what i think that often happens is that or what personally happened to me, if, if I may share before we move on to the next topic, is that um, the people around you or the people that is closer to you, like my husband or your husband, you know, at some point you need to go out of this. Like you need to go out of like sharing things with them because it can also take a toll on them. You know, they're so close to you that they can also get super involved and be dragged along with what is going on with you right so mm -hmm. at some point you need to really you know take take uh, control of the situation accept that you're going through that and perhaps go and look for someone who could um walk you through the process of getting out of it right or coach you through the process of getting out of it and and i think it's so so good that you share that that you you look for professional help because mm -hmm. you know it can be so great to have someone who is there to listen to you to help you like just talk about the the issue unpack it and and find solutions right oh yeah i it's so true and it, it's it is uh, it's very true about like um the amount you share with your partner uh mm. because you do want you want them to be you want to give them your best self 
and yeah. you expect the best, their best self. And while obviously I'm always there to listen to anyone, um, yeah. my partner, uh, my sister, my best friends, my friends, my uh, strangers, tell, <laughs> go on, spill it, hon. But, um, but yeah, it's, it, it gets to a point where it's just like, they're not, they're not qualified either. You know, it's just yeah, like yeah. talk to someone, you know, who's completely out of it and can really talk you through it. And a lot of it is, um, just, uh, you know, self-acceptance. Yeah, Mostly absolutely. like I know, like at this point, I kind of know what she's even going to tell me, but I, I'll complain about it anyway. I mean, it still pops up in my head. Like, I'm like, oh, they're probably doing this because they hate it and they want to fire me. <laughs> and it's that she's like, now, why would you think that? <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I also have my therapist and it's like, I'm so glad I found her. And yeah. she has helped me through so many different issues that I thought like, oh, if I wouldn't have had her, I would have... Uh, driven crazy like my husband crazy really because yeah. it was such a present topic in my life that if I wouldn't have had someone to just bounce ideas and and ways of getting out of that situation then yeah I don't know what I would have done um Mary Kate I want to uh, uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about style and get more into the craft like we were really getting deep uh, going deep into how we go about our creative mm -hmm. um, career and the things that you, you know, as a creative, you go through uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in your work and in your, yeah, in your practice. And I was recording yesterday, I was recording an episode with uh, Kevin Cantrell. Do you know him? Yeah, uh, we did. We, we, he was at, we, he was at Letter yeah. West. Yeah, I yeah, met him then, but I knew, yeah, of course I, I know his work. Exactly. So, um, and so this episode for those listening, this episode is coming out right after this one. Uh, so wait for it. Um, and I asked him, how did he develop his style? He has a, such a distinct style with all these details and filigree and stuff. And, and he was speaking about how he started, you know, developing his style by, by observing vintage books and posters. And he said that he tried to crack the system behind it just by observation, you know, through observ observation, he was trying to crack the, si the system behind it. And this is how he created a system for himself. Right. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of finding the system behind your art. Right. Yes, so yes. I want to pass it on to you and ask you whether you also feel you have a system or a method or some sort of formula that you can follow and it works for you i mean it's funny that his answer was yeah like a system or a formula because his work looks it looks like there's like he has an algorithm for it or something <laughs> because it's so yes. pristine and perfect where mine not so much i i'm i like i i uh strive a little bit more under chaos probably the piba <laughs> But, um, but similarly, certainly vintage books and um, vintage stuff. So when I, I mean, even like in high school, um, I was always interested in vintage stuff. Um, mm. So I remember collecting anything that had like fun type on it and weird little illustrations. Like I had uh, I, I remember having uh, that Victorian clip art, those Victorian clip art books <laughs> yeah. um, with the CD-ROM in high school and uh, just like making collages and stuff out of them. <laughs> so in art school and uh, when I took design classes, I always had something with a little bit of a vintage twist, mm. but I also really liked illustration and drawing really weird looking people. Um, and so I think my style came from all three of those things. So my interest in vintage ephemera and advertising and my love of design and, uh, illustrations and, uh, like, so in my design projects to make my art or make my design project make sense. I just, I hand drew the fonts, you know, I, mm. um, 
because otherwise I've like the font wouldn't match my overly textured, weird looking people illustrations. And so that's kind of when I discovered lettering and I was doing these like really um, kind of rough drawn, but in a Victorian style. So it didn't have the precision. It was really loose. And mm. um, I was also at the time really inspired by Eduardo Recife. Um, he, he had uh, that, I mean, he has, I don't know, the misprinted type.com, which is so funny. I haven't thought about that in so long, but he had that like, those How is really it called again? Misprinted type? Misprinted type. Um, yeah, it's it that website. That it was like everything was hand drawn. It like that's my first website was inspired by it. Like like uh, pencil scribbles as a button and stuff like that. Uh, so it really inspired me to think that like design didn't need to be really like tight and perfect, mm. <laughs> which was good because it definitely suits my process more and so anything that was like askew and textured and rough and not on not aligned and not perfect was really what i was drawn to and that really inspired uh, a lot of my work and um and now it's i really it's funny like i mean i'm never i never really have like pristine work i'm not big in drawing in vectors <laughs> i like something with a gritty line, a textured line. And while I think a lot of my work is uh, certainly a little bit more buttoned up um, since those early projects, but um, there's definitely like a, you can draw a line right through from um, back in early, the early 2000s to now. Yeah, so, so I, I hear that, you know, something that is constant in your style has to do with the technique and the overall aspect of it and then you combine you know your love for illustration your love for typography and your vintage inspiration into and you juggle all together mm -hmm. and and you have this kind of like this blanket of technique on top of it which binds it all together right yep yeah definitely i mean it's like the a little bit of wonky letters certainly like the colors I love a lot of color um and I think just exploring all that with just with by drawing it by my mm. hand just kind of creates the style I think um it's something that you work on and develop uh one of my favorite things to do actually when I'm kind of stuck on a project is to reference my older work yeah. um, sometimes just to get that like like sometimes I look I'm just like oh my god that lettering is so awful that a is backwards or what on earth is going with those on with those serifs why why did you do that so but then let's I look fix at that I'm in like, the next project <laughs> yeah and I'm just like <laughs> yeah fuck it do it <laughs> like um I don't know, it, it was, in, in a way, I look at my older work and I'm just like, I don't know, there's something kind of fun and naive to it that yeah. it's hard to capture now because it's just, I'm just too aware <laughs> of how good things can actually be. And <laughs> I wish I could have, it's like, it's like sometimes I either feel like I'm reaching that, you know, the Kevin uh, formula or I'm reaching like how I used to draw when I was uh, three years old. <laughs> Somewhere in between. I love that. Cracking the, you know, the formula that you used to use when you were two years old. Or yes. something. Which is like, if only I just that unabashed confidence in everything you drew. Absolutely. So I, I want to ask you a little bit about the business side of things and because you have worked for so many amazing brands in your career uh, you made projects for let me name some of of your clients target current Gear books maces and i want to ask you what were some of the things that worked for you in order to gain these client projects and and reach out to potential clients i think that oftentimes we we have the impression that 
accomplished artists uh, or illustrators, they, you know, work is coming their way. And, and I want to hear your story. If you, if you were, if there were any actions or any things that you put in place in order to, to get those dream assignments. Well, it's funny. I mean, now just thinking back earlier to our conversation, believe it or not, I don't reach out to clients. <laughs> I start writing emails and I, I, I'm like, oh, that sounds so stupid and desperate. I'm really bad at that. Mm -hmm. I really wish I was better. Um, I feel like, honestly, oh, this is so weirdly embarrassing, but I've only done it like three times. And the one time and, it I, even I, worked. And And, and how, 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 how was that, that, that time that, that, that it didn't even work? It was, uh, it was funny. It was give us, actually, give us the deeds, give us the, deeds, <laughs> the templates. <laughs> it was, I know. Oh my God. Um, well it was, it was for this one in particular was for a magazine cover, um, for, I think it was a city magazine and you know, they don't pay great. So but I love working with them because they're usually mm -hmm. the best people. And so it was, um, it was for Baltimore magazine. Mm. And I think, I think she's since married. So I don't know her last name. Amanda <laughs> was who I reached out to. And I was just like, Oh, I was just looking at the cover we did for uh, Baltimore brides and uh, blah, 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 blah. And she was like, how serendipitous. I was just, reaching out to you like Indeed. she had a cover in mind for the next month so so uh, I we ended up wearing together and you know so that worked out and while it's yeah not a big client it's just I love working I love editorial work mm -hmm. um a lot of it's just like you're working with art directors who are just like they're on it with feedback they know oh, yeah. exactly what they're doing it's so efficient it's, they're so efficient and they're yeah. so They're, they're always so fun and just like the nicest people, not saying yeah. agencies or anyone else is not, but um, they're bigger teams usually. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, so smaller magazines and stuff are always fun to work on. And the immediacy of like two months from then getting it where usually it's just like a year later, you'll see the cover you did or packaging you did. And uh, yeah, the, the waiting game. So, yeah, I'm really, I mean, you tell me how to, everyone in, DM me on Instagram how you, how you guys get clients. So a lot, a lot of it has been um, people finding me and reaching out to me, which is really mm. great. Um, but I will say I do keep that up uh, through, I, I think, <laughs> actually on uh, posting on Instagram and just like a mm. lot of my personal work. Um, a lot of my new, every new client I get usually references um, one or if not all or any of my personal work. So, yeah, I mean, that's also why getting not to go back to creative block, but just to say, like, it's just such a important part and such a rewarding part. I mean, talk about Insta Instagramification. <laughs> Yeah. And posting on Instagram and people liking it and being like, ah, it's fun to, you know, make something and post it done and be proud of it. But so it's also a way for people to um, see new work of mine and kind of always be reminded that I, hi, I exist. I know I'm not emailing you <laughs> or, um, but I also, and this is something that's kind of dried up just due to time. I really, I, was hoping every year I would make a new zine and send them out oh, to yeah. people. Um, I sent them to uh, clients. So I do have a mailing list mm. that I should utilize more because I, if anything, it's just, I'm, if I'm not good on email, I'm good, I'm good sending a little piece of mail. I like surprising people with mail. Who doesn't love getting a little special piece of mail? Um, So I think that's basically how I keep myself promoted. It's interesting because in a way you are making those contacts with your clients, maybe not directly sending 
called emails, but you do have these touch points where you send a scene or a postcard or you post something on Instagram and you create new personal work. So you have your own personal way of, of doing that in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, it's, I mean, yeah, like I wouldn't say I do. I just sit back and wait till the client emails yeah. me. There's a lot of things I do uh, in between, certainly posting on Instagram because you just know most people are browsing Instagram at least mm. once a day, <laughs> uh, particularly art directors. I would assume a lot of them are looking for people there. Um, yeah, I try to upload stuff to Behance. Mm. Um, I never really get much uh, action directly from Behance, but I do mm. know people reach out for me there. I don't think I've uploaded new stuff in the past two years, but yeah, <laughs> I'll get around to it. But you have your portfolio yet there in on oh yeah 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 so i okay. try and so it's just like yeah you never know when where people are going to reach out to you and um i think uh i'm i'm gearing up for like i said i'm, I'm i've like never felt better creatively lately and i am actually gonna do a new skillshare class <laughs> so um it's so not wait just for it everybody so actually like for the past all those all the past years that i've been like yeah i'll be announcing it on instagram it's more <laughs> just a way for me to just just follow me on instagram and i'll probably have something out someday but this time Amazing. for real we're gonna add your your handle um so your your uh instagram handle is Mer mary kate mcdavid mcdavid okay mm -hmm. um so i want to you know, we, we were just talking about client work, but you also, you know, you have done so much um, in your career. You, 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 you do publish this, these little scenes that you sell on your shop. You have your own shop. You had your Etsy shop before um, and you publish books. You also taught classes, online classes and workshops. I want to ask you which one of these different venues or things that you did um, across your career do you think that had a bigger impact on on your career as a lettering artist and and i want to give you an example perhaps from from uh, of how that happened for me um for instance when i when i wrote when i published the uh, the golden secrets of lettering my book um that was in 2016 and at that, at that moment i didn't realize how how much of an impact that would have on my future self and my future work right and mm -hmm. nowadays that that single uh uh book defines what i do today right yeah. and I, at the time i didn't know that you know i didn't think about this book strategically and nowadays i tend to think of like hey this thing that i'm doing right now or this self-initiated project that i'm doing right now may have an impact on that thing that i will be doing in five years from now so I want to give it a thought and I want to perhaps um, be aware of how that may, you know, steer my career in one or an other direction, right? So I want to see how that, you know, which one of those projects that you did along the way had a really big impact on, on your career. You know, that's, it's hard to say because it does feel like every few years, like, okay, going back to the very first thing I ever, like, was were making these chalkboards that I was making, mini goals chalkboards. <sighs> and I was posting them on blogs and stuff. My first, my, my first freelance job was with Chronicle Books because they emailed me seeing that ch chalkboard on a blog and we published it into a notepad. Mm. And so that was um, 2009. Mm. And sometimes I think back and if I was making those chalkboards with the intent of like, oh, this is going to be seen by publishers, I would have been like uh, a mess, you know? <laughs> so it's like early on, but it is, you still like, so now when you put things out there, you do think about the longevity because mm. we were here where oh, yeah. we are. But early on, I wasn't thinking like, well, this is going to, this is, this is the pivotal 
project that's going to, you know, bounce you off into your career. So it's like, it's kind of like every, you know, uh, major milestone in your Mm. career kind of has a new one or something. Um, because I would also say, um, my Skillshare classes or my first Skillshare class, which I think I did in 2013 was huge. I mean, one, it got so many students really quick and I mean, I'm so embarrassed (laughs) because I was so nervous. It's, I was like, I had never like done any real film filmed in front of it like been like in front of a camera being like okay tell everyone how you do exactly everything so oh my god yeah it's an art you have to grow into it oh yeah it's not yeah it doesn't come naturally (laughs) yeah like I remember being like oh I'll I'll know what to do and then like my very very patient friend helped me help me film it because Skillshare didn't film that one and uh I remember just being like, oh, I'll be fine. I know what I'm talking about. I mean, I do it every day. And then he's like, okay. like, And I'm like, hi, I'm Mary Kate McDevitt. Welcome. Like, it's so, oh my God, it's it's hilarious. I can, I can laugh at it. Uh, so that one was really pivotal. And then like maybe certain client projects that, you know, kind of like put you up a level and like maybe even, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there's just been a lot of just little, um, little moments that kind of all add up together. I don't know if mm. like I had one big project that launched me really. But it seemed like going back to the to the one Skillshare class or the first Skillshare class that yeah. you did. You you saw something there, or you you saw in a way a certain reaction or feedback from the audience where you said like, "Hey, there might be something here that I'm doing right." Um, yeah, yeah. And then you it it pushed you to to record more classes and to come up with new topics, right? Yes. I mean, and you, you also have your books in lettering and illustration. So exactly, exactly. Following the Skillshare class, I did hand lettering ledger Mm. and, uh, like four years after that doing illustration workshop and, um, doing journals and stuff all in between, uh, dealing with publishing. But yeah, that first Skillshare class, like I had done workshops in Portland, um, teaching lettering but like not many yeah and uh so I wasn't really that like I I turned down working with Skillshare for like they they luckily they tracked me down for like a full year at least like I remember I was still living in Portland when they first emailed me and I was in New York when I did um when I actually said yes and did one because I was just like I I don't know anything about teaching or just like I'm there's much better people qualified you know to do this than me and they're like no I think you know you and they said this really great thing that really opened it up and took a lot of pressure off it's just like different students need different perspectives so Mm. and I say that to everyone now I'm just like it's from your voice it's you no one does it like you yeah and it's just like that you're special you are, you truly are. And your process is unique and you don't have to have the same talking points that other per- other people do or the same process at all. Yeah. There isn't one way to do anything. And I, I think that really um, maybe like, oh, okay, maybe you're right. So I talked about my process and it also, uh, make, you know, writing that class actually made me reflect on my process and mm. and go back through my sketchbooks and see what I do to um, make my work. Um, So it was really nice to actually just like break down what my process even was because, I mean, I think I even alluded to, I'm like process, process. (laughs) Earlier, I'm just like, as if I'm not like, as if I don't have a process and my work is chaotic and it's not. (laughs) I mean, there is, you know, a method. Um, So it was, and then it opened up how much I really like teaching. So, um, yeah, doing more Skillshare classes, 
doing five more after that and teaching. I taught at my alma mater. I taught at Tyler School of Art um, for several semesters. And mm. I taught at uh, a few other. I taught at U Arts and more in Philly and uh, have done workshops. People uh, brought me to do workshops in a bunch of cities and it's been really fun. And I really like um, seeing other people make things and it's something that really like really inspires me so uh yeah it was i would say that yeah do, making that skillshare cl cl class was huge it was really fun and i was um <laughs> i forget what paper oh i think it was the new york post so who knows but they uh contacted me to do um an interview about skillshare mm -hmm. and I had this big long conversation with this woman and I think um, what actually ended up in the article was Skillshare is great, says Mary Kate, <laughs> which is really funny. But like people recognized me and knew my work from my Skillshare, from Skillshare, which was so cool. And uh, which is like, yes, I really want to make a, a couple, I have a, a couple ideas for some new Skillshare mm. classes. So I'm going to do six real quick and then stop for another seven years. <laughs> Amazing. We are going to be looking forward to those. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mary Kate, as we wrap up the episode, I want to invite you to do an exercise, an exercise for a second. Sure. Um, so you have been in this over for over a decade now, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to, I want you to look back at the Mary Kate that started from the perspective of the experienced Mary Kate that you are today. Mm -hmm. And I want you to think about what, what were the things that you would do differently? Um, and I think this must, this may be especially insightful for those that are just starting and are wondering, okay, in which, what are the boundaries that I need to put? What are the things that I need to do? What, what are some of the, you know, give me, give me some clues, give me some, um, some things that I could put into, uh, into action. Yes. Okay. So what I want to say, of course, is I wouldn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. Everything that I've ever done has led me to this moment and yeah. all the mistakes that go with it. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I, let's see, cause, uh, I do think I feel like I did a lot of the things that I would have wanted to do, which is mm. like put your work out there, which is, mm. a, is a thing I tell people now that, um, or I think maybe, maybe people are more aware of it now, social media being what it is, but not to be afraid of if it's perfect or not. I mean, mm. th those are things that I'm like, when am I ever going to make something perfect anyway? Just put it out there and see what the response is. Um, but like I also would tell myself, I wish, you know, I took a little bit more time on that. Or I mean, it's just like I wish I could go back and fix the things I made <laughs> and just be like, ah, you could have chose a different color for that. I mean, those are so minor. I think, um, I don't know, I maybe... Like, I really liked making stuff and selling my mm. art. I, I think mm. that's a really crucial thing for um, people to do is to actually, like, be the author of your work mm. uh, because it's so often that, you know, like, one, like, even just doing personal work and putting it on Instagram, it kind of, like, only serves a very minor purpose for just that one hour of that one day sometimes. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. have much longevity. So maybe think about like um what kind of work you want to be doing and actually make it in some way and put mm. it out there in a way that people uh can actually experience it more mm. um i wish i learned like i like i kind of wish i learned how to be more like website-y <laughs> but like programming and stuff yeah or... I do kind of wish I wish I learned uh animation more mm. that's something people are getting so good at I wish I knew what those apps were but I could just do that now <laughs> I that know like that's true. such a cop-out of that answer of that question 
being like, I wouldn't change a damn thing. <laughs> but um, it's also, I mean, if I'm talking to Mary Kate, then she is so stubborn. She is like, I'm telling her, you should hire an accountant now. And, <laughs> and she's like, yeah, right. Like, I could do it. That's myself. a good one. Hire an accountant. I mean, it early. is a, it is a good one. Hire an accountant. Have hi, you know what? Here's one. This is this is what I was actually. I got it. Um, and it's so boring. Mary Kate is not excited about this. Old Mary Kate. It's um, getting your contracts mm. and understanding what the scope of work is before signing up for a project there have been oh, a yeah. lot of times where i'm just oh, yeah. like i felt unprepared so it's it it does it's really helpful to have a solid contract and like back then i i mean i didn't i didn't have anything i didn't have anything and i would just say yes to whatever they wanted mm. and um it took a long time to shake that like the client is always right. The client is always right. Just take whatever budget they have, take whatever usage they have, work for hire, who cares? As long as you're yeah. getting work. And I, I wish I was more knowledgeable about that starting out or um, a more like not giving up so much, just gave up mm. so much. Um, yeah. Like I did a book cover and I'm pretty sure I got paid like 500 bucks only to find out now, like, I think I was randomly, it was like a YA book. And um, I was randomly tagged in Instagram. I'm just like, oh, my God, I remember that. I think I literally did, did that book cover in like 2010 or 11. Mm. I think it was 2010. And I now see that this book, she wrote like 20 of them. Mm. And this, it's always the same I'm not going to say what it was because I don't care. And it's not like I get any money from it anyway. And, um, and, and it's the same logo. So it's like a whole big series, like, like obviously not as big as Twilight, but like imagine. <laughs> so, wow. and I was just like, wow. And it's just like, you should have got paid for that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah it should have I been. Mean, if, if, if they're, if they're successful, it, it, it is also due to your cover, right? Or yeah. to the design yeah. that you created for them. So you you should get a cut from that. Yeah. So protecting your work is something that you will... Mm. Yeah, I wish I was just even more aware of it because the more you're confident in the way... Because yeah. it's like, I mean, we're, we're small business owners, which is pretty wild. Um, you know, I think mm. a lot of people... Uh, often also get an agent early on and I didn't yeah um, and I only had an agent for like two or three years and I'm currently without an agent mm. um, uh, I, uh, I have a book agent but not a but um, yeah it, and it, it so it just gives you more confidence and more ownership yeah. and like yeah more knowledgeable about the work you're making your business and it's really important. So it took a long time for me to get the courage to ask for like more money if it's one oh, yeah. more revision or um, better usage rights being like, and you know, what buyout means and yeah. what like. Absolutely. Um, and also I think yeah. that so many that, of the people you will be, I'm, I'm saying this to those listening, many of the people that you will be working with, they know this or they know that you you may be charging an extra for um exclusive rights or for for i don't know for licensing the artwork yeah. beyond five years or two years right so um if you don't mm -hmm. claim that you will come across as mm -hmm. unprofessional right and 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 they they expect this from you so just yeah do yep. the thing as you know um go about the business as the business wor works right um so that's a great reminder and uh, and also i will add yeah. to this you know i think that oftentimes the fact that we are not careful with what we charge to our clients also comes back to us in terms of um not being fair to ourselves and um 
not compensating ourselves for the work we do. I don't know if this happened to you, but, and I haven't shared this before, but it happened to me that it, it, it was late in the game that I started paying a salary to myself, that I started actually paying money out of my business bank account into my personal bank account. And before that, it was just like, okay, yeah, just right. send the send the mm-hmm. send the payment. I will just extract some just money, money from time to Coming time. In. But there were no, I was not administrating the money in any other way, right? So, um, and the way you go about money within your business and for for yourself, um, also reflects in the way you go about charging for your work and 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 stating your fees and sending uh, proposals to your clients. So I think money is like a big, is a big issue in terms of like pricing, of course, your work, but also managing your financial, the financials of Mm -hmm. your business, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it does. And it all, it absolutely wraps in. How is it not going to affect how you conduct your business, which is through creating art. And if you're not like on top of the business aspect, Absolutely. it's not gonna instill much confidence in you being able to work with client. Like that's what we do. So I do think like the earlier you can get on top of those things, the more you, you can just like put into focusing on the actual creating of the art, which is what the, the fun stuff. Um, so if you have all that stuff squared away and you know you're being taken care of and you feel confident in that, you can put the focus on what the, all the fun stuff is. And um, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. It's definitely something that took me way longer than it really should have. But like, <laughs> so it, it's like, it's, you know, this, it's like, uh, I, if only I started sooner, the same thing, it's the yeah. same thing I say, like, I wish, like therapy, it's just like, I just wish I started sooner. It's just everything. Uh, it just, it matters so much. Yeah. And it's not, because it, it's, yeah, it's it's your livelihood and um, yeah, and, and I it's think your it's your brand. It's your it's your business. So, and it will only help the way you come across yeah, to your clients too. I think like it's so, as, as to, it, I this may be so useful for those that are starting. I wish someone had told me to get um, on top of my finances when I as as I started early in my career. So I think that uh, people get on top of your finances. Administrate your money, administrate the money in your business. Don't look yeah. away. Uh, this is a, a very important part of keeping your business running and and keeping a container for creating your the work you love doing. So Mary Kate, this was an amazing session. Uh, to wrap up the sessions, I normally I normally do I play a little game. The the game is called finish the sentence. So I basically start the sentence and you complete it. I don't know if you if if we played it last time that you were on the podcast. Did we? We did play a game. Was it this? I don't or... remember. I think do we you, were did answering you have questions another one back or then. Was it this? Like we were answering questions from the audience and stuff. Uh, so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yes. So, yeah. Are you ready? That's what it was. The most fun thing okay. in the world is. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's supposed to be fast, right? I knew I was going to say something about cats. Um, it's watch it by cat. Uh, it's when I make my cat dance <laughs> and I say, uh, get down, Peppy, get down, like get low. If you're get watching low, this Peppy. on YouTube, it's, you will get to it see does Mary make Kate me laugh dance. every single time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is how she gets down. But she I just has it. a really blank, my style is... far off look at stare in her face. <laughs> I've never told anyone about the fact that Playful and fun. I. Ooh. Secrets. Secrets. Um, <laughs> I'm like, what, what do I want to spill? I never told anyone the fact that I. 
my god we missed that topic for the next episode like for the I next time you're on the podcast I, I, we're definitely gonna touch on that I mean, it was because I was I, mean, I have this frown line that I've had probably since I was an infant. I know we're on like quick question thing, but just I don't hey, I don't need to say anything, but I was getting married and I wanted that not to be in the picture. Oh, so that's a key hanger for, for the next episode that Mary Kate is on the podcast. So Major if I wouldn't be doing this for a living, I would be Okay. Okay. <laughs> Either a something with like gardening My or something that I don't know how that. to do or interior design. <laughs> yeah, there's so many things. <laughs> um, well, he tells me so many times that I'm it cute. It is true. Right now is the perfect moment to. Yes. Mary Kate, thank you so much for being Get on the out show there, today. baby. Where can people find you? <laughs> you can find me on Instagram at Mary Kate McDevitt and on Twitter at Mary Kate McD, which I probably only retweet things about cats. I mean, see, we are going to add um, all of this to, my website, to the show notes. We're also going to add your books so that everybody can find them. And thank you so much again, Mary Kate, for being to, on the show today and sharing all of the things that you have shared with our listeners. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. See, see you on the next episode of Open Studio. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so have much for having me, Bye-bye. Martina. This was so much fun. Bye, everyone. So this is it. I hope you loved this episode. You can find me, the host of the show, on social networks at Martina Flor on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you have a question or comments, go to martinaflor.com slash podcast, where you can see previous episodes, find show notes, and send voice memos with your comments and questions. You can also watch these episodes on YouTube. Just go to martinaflor.com slash YouTube to find them. You can, of course, listen to all our episodes on your favorite podcast platform. If you loved this episode, subscribe to this podcast. And if you leave us a review, it will help others find us. Thank you all for listening and see you in the next episode of Martina Flores Open Studio. Bye bye. talking to you i mean there's so many things that, that i fun. want to talk you know it's, it's like it's crazy but um <laughs> i know i love these sessions you know it's like i think i it's just a a, a great way of connecting mm-hmm. with people and it is so interesting because i have had so um so many mm-hmm. lettering artists from our generation um and it is amazing to see their transformation yeah. like uh, some of them have become like <clears throat> um, uh, 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 meditation uh, teachers or, you know, they have like, for instance, Eric Marinovich, he has started a new company, like a type design company. Yeah. He quit lettering altogether. Like all of the things that is like, so, and also I, I see it in you. I, you know, I've been following your journey forever, really, like since you started, I think. And, and, and I've seen... Um, and this is just bits of information that I get from social media or online, but I've seen your transformation. Like you, you, you change cities, uh, you change the way you show up on, on Instagram. Like, you know, like I, you, you, you sense this. And then when we get to have these conversations, you see like, Hey, w- wait, like this is a real mm. person. And she went through a lot of different things. And I think this is, this is really yeah. great for us. Yeah. I think to, to realize that, um, that, you know, your, your career will change throughout 10 years. It will change. Your, your focus will change. Your priorities will change. Yes. And that's totally oh fine, God. you know, because you think like, oh my God, I'm, I'm losing my identity because I yeah. stopped doing this or that, or I'm not doing any skill share class or whatever. People will say, we think like, what the hell happened? And, 
Mary Kate is not mm-hmm. the Mary Kate we used to know, but you know, and and it's not, and that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, it's so true. And maybe it is just a thing, like when we are either in or approaching our forties, like oh, yeah. the way we see, like one, we have seen so oh, yeah. many of yeah. our colleagues grow up. Isn't that so cute? Like, I mean, like since some of us were in our 20s yeah. and now like I'm I'm 37 and it's just like so so it's like we've seen it and so we have this perspective and just like have been able to let go of so many of those things like you know 10 oh, or yeah. 7 8 years ago I did have this totally different perspective about like mm. yeah like if I were to stop and like that we're so like in the moment and everything yeah. needs to be. And I think we have a little bit more space and uh, confidence, I think, too, to be like, it's not all just going to like, f- yeah. you know, sizzle you feel, that's, up that's and actually you know, great because evaporate I, away. I feel more um, in control. Like I feel so that quickly. I, you know, I, if I'm not, if I wouldn't, if I love every single opportunity that comes my way and that's actually cool, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's amazing. That's why, yeah. Yeah, it is, isn't it? God, it just feels so much better. It it really does. There oh, is yeah. this, like, letting go of that whole hustle and time we had I think that also, the, like, people from our generation that, that was growing up in this or develop their career in within this hostile uh, culture. I think we, we learned a lot. Like, we, we hit the wall several times and... And it's great that we could tell other people, hey, perhaps yeah. this is not the the way you need, like the way to go. There's other ways to go ar- about your career, and um, yeah, and I think it's it can be enlightening 